Greetings. I'm Dante McFadden. I am the programmer for Black Lens with Milwaukee Film. Black Lens is a programming and outreach initiative that is dedicated to promoting uh, the work of Black filmmakers throughout North America. We have for our Black History Month programming the honor to collaborate with Array Releasing, a company which is owned by Ava DuVernay. They are showing for Black History Month, Sankofa, the 1993 film by Haile Garima, um, who's um, been long staple of uh, Black independent cinema for decades. Um, it is our honor for Black Lens for Milwaukee Film uh, to be able to uh, have screened this film. And it's my honor to have Mr. Garima with us. So I'll have him join me. Mr. Karima, how do you do? How are you doing, my brother? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Uh, it's yeah. an honor to talk with you, and uh, it's an honor to screen your film. We really appreciate that. Thank you, my brother. <clears throat> so I'd like to begin by asking you how the idea of the film came about. Well, um, initially, it's really uh, about, it came about because of my own uh, need to understand uh, the African-American um, uh, people I found in America. I came from Ethiopia, Africa, and I was completely unaware of uh, the historical journey Africans have taken in the Americas. All I knew was at the time I came to, uh, to America, African-Americans were called Negro Americans. And it, it was uh, something that had completely uh, decapitated the African part. And so mm -hmm. here it is, Negro American meaning in my head at the time as uh, some race that that was um, uh, harvested out of the Americas and uh, its linkage to Africa was completely um, uh, non-existent in my, in my, or in the state I was mentally in. And of course, in my encounter from Chicago to California, right. I kept developing a story initially with Joe, uh, and then um, Nunu, the the mother, the two characters, the struggle between the two characters is the beginning seed, original idea in order, or what in the end after 20, maybe 20 years later, it became Sankofa. And so, uh, the initial part was that there was this, not that I was as fluent as I would be now in explaining, you know, the progression of things, but within my own incoherency and colonial mindset, um, uh, you know, I was, I was uh, uh, totally unprepared, how, unprepared as to how race operated in the American landscape. And so as I studied, uh, there was this love and hate relationship between Africa and the African-American in one way or another, the psychological fallout of slavery that I know later on that I realized, but initially it was a, a kind of com confusion. Uh, my, myself, did they come to Africa to uh, enslaved or did they fight back? I'm still doing a film <laughs> trying to work that out. And so Sankofa came about from that, you know, genesis. Yeah, yes. And so you talk about the central relationship between the mother Nunu and the son Joe. When did you decide to incorporate the storyline of Mona, um, who then throughout the narrative we identify as Shola? As, as I studied, uh, my, my script initially was just um, I was departing from the historical interpretation of the plantation school of enslavement, which actually disfigured the African part. And I, 
as I ventured initially from the outsourcing the plantation school of literature in slavery, I also had demented perspective as to black people in America. So primarily my initial script was black people at the mercy of white brutality um, uh, and their humanity got lost. And I was very unhappy as I was studying the, uh, the you know, the fact that it was mean white people versus uh, victim black people, just that dilemma, uh, you know, incarcerated my script for years. And to liberate myself out of that is a series of research, study, journey into the, into the Southern part of America, the Caribbean, Africa, studying and working. So a lot of, you know, the characters were then begin to be born out of that whole journey of, you know, discovering, exploring, um, replacing this demented perspective, which I, which is the pitfalls of interpreting enslavement, because it's easier for everybody to say white people were bad, black people were uh, victims. It's a, that itself is a game that I felt I was part of. So once I overcame this and wanted to, you know, wanted to uh, really look at it as if I came from Africa. I have names, I have a name, I have, I come from somewhere and I start to lend, you know, the, the Africans who journeyed uh, in spite of the time gap, the timeline issue, I start to lend myself that if I came, I would have a name. I wouldn't be slave one, slave two, slave three. If I came, I would be highly. Uh, so I start to really uh, liberate my own script from colonial mindset of the plantation school of literature. And that's when all the, the dimensional characters started to be born. And it's fascinating listening to you talk about how the story develops and how you shifted the focus from enslavement um, within this um, Manichaean framework, um, like what you were saying, um, you know, black people being the victims and white people being uh, the evil, powerful ones. You focus it more so on resistance. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, I'm really interested in how, hearing how the characters, uh, more characters were developed. And, I'm curious to also know, how did you come up with um, the idea of um, this rebellion um, that emerged among the enslaved people within the, within your film? Well, it was, it was a, you know, again, it was a, a logical discovery that Africans from day one, uh, the battle between the plantation uh, owners and the Africans, enslaved Africans, the immediate struggle between the two of them and whatever level is to for the plantation owner to invent a slave and the Africans to refuse to be that entity. That begins the resistance. So day one from Africa, it begins. And so that is, you know, it's not, uh, it is, it was, you know, at the time, like I'm coming to America, you know, African Americans are still called Negro Americans, and so you can imagine it's uh, you know white America's interpretation, especially unlike Brazil or the Caribbean, white Americans completely um, intellectuals, historians, governments insisted in uh, completely um, uh, eliminating the resistance aspect of the African people in the Americas, especially in the United States. And so, you know, that that itself, you know, permeates black intellectual, uh, you know, uh, expressions. And so for me uh, here, just to say the immediate refusal to be what, the, you know, the the you know the you know the captured african is subjected to is a key 
insistent throughout in whatever level. And I realize even to dare to love or to even put a plant, uh, black people insisted always in, in planting something. That itself is, you know, food. Africans in their food constantly, you know, if you look at the South Carolina and rice history, Africans in their food were fighting. So the food itself was resisting. The language itself was resisting, but it was all uh, for a long time. Now that more books are coming out and, uh, you know, in terms of escape, the escape, the marunage, the Underground Railroad itself was a game to some extent because it's a chapter that white America selectively preferred than the Africans who were terrorists against the United States. The escapes, the Maroons of South Carolina, the Maroons of Florida, the Maroons of Texas and Oklahoma, they were terrorists of uh, slave owning planets. And so that shaved part of that history to this day is overwhelming impact on the on the on the uh, history of black people in, or African people in America is a, it's a disastrous to this day you know all right. these things that we're still treadmilling we're still looping comes from that whole um, the the fact they exiled the the resistance aspect of black reality African reality the impact is today till today you know so Africans till till today you know a major many people could not believe black people fought back in Africa because mm -hmm. the information is, you know slave to call African slave itself is a, is a disastrous enslaved Africans is the interpretive the correct one and so uh, that that to me uh, is something I I I I uh, I honed into. I I I went into and and Shango was you know as a result of that you know you know people could not imagine they could have been Shango in Louisiana or South Carolina. There were, there were, many Shangos, many you know rebellion leaders. Not the usual Nat Turner or the Underground Railroad, etc. But there were folks. And, I, and now more and more we know that the Underground Railroad first started towards the southern part of, towards uh, Mexico, towards <laughs> the Gulf of Mexico, towards the, Nicaragua, towards the you know South, South you know South America, and so Marunaj, you know you know the one that is very um, independent and militant did not incorporate white people. And that history has to be eliminated to continue a modern, uh, modernized captivation of the Africans to not have an intellectual liberation um, journey towards those scapees that were merciless and prudent and cunning in the way they were fighting slave slavery or the slave sure. crisis. Yes, and as you, uh, you know, crafted the screenplay, how did you go about identifying who would be involved in the making of the film, the cast, crew? Well, you know, I come out of that that whole that whole you know Charles Burnett, Larry Clark, UCLA friends, where we we yeah. we we just you know we didn't know the implications of many aspects of the film business, but we felt. We tell our own story and the consequences of uh, working, saving money, and doing your own movie. That is the tradition where I came from. So, if now I'm not sure a historical uh, uh, subject matter of you know the you know of that kind, I would have been discouraged if I knew the implications. But I just ventured in that typical boldness of. I'll do my film, even if I don't have all the money. I'll start the film. I'll start shooting the film, etc. So it is really uh, once I came to Washington D.C. at ha and teaching at Howard, I was at ready now after so many years of belaboring to liberate my script to where it should be, and then where should I shoot it? 
uh, I wrote it really for Louisiana. It has a Catholic mm -hmm. accent, uh, but it was racism. I could not, um, the, the people who owned the plantation um, land and the plantation houses were very hostile when they saw a whole black crew from Howard, mm -hmm. my students, myself going in trying to do a film on slavery. White people were automatically intimidated and refused to, um, to give us something we can afford in terms of the way they hacked their price, they were intimidated. You know, there's, you know, this is there's something many people, there's automatic, uh, uh, I'll say, uh, genomics memory that kicks in. When a group yeah. of black people are trying to unearth something, there's a whole force mm -hmm. of white people without, you know, just the genomics memory starts to unleash itself. And it's, it's yeah. not studied well, but now I'm, you know, from even after Sankofa, the genomics, the genomics, the way it, it is in the memory is built into the genes of white and black people in America is mind boggling. It's another planet to farm into. And so uh, then that's when I start going towards trying to do it in Cuba, trying to do it in Venezuela, trying to do it even in Africa. I looked for sugarcane plantations in West Africa, in Burkina Faso, Ghana, etc. I was going all over the place to find a low budget way of doing this movie and getting a co-production partners. Uh, not in America. America refused everything. Uh, American Playhouse, oh, no way. Um, mm. PBS, CPB, no way. So we mm. had to go to Europe, get some money from Germany, uh, Channel 4 England, two African countries, very key to it, Burkina Faso and Ghana. We, we forged a co-production uh, relationship with them and it began to be realized. And Jamaica, uh, it so happened that an African descendant was in charge of a whole sugarcane field and said, have it, it's yours. I mean, that itself is just, if it was quantified in finance terms, I couldn't afford it. And so everything fall in place over time, although it took arduous years of time to do it. And so none of it is a calculated production, except, right. you know, the, the genes of it is that independent spirit of I will do my movie. I don't need white people to stop me from doing it. That itself is part of the capital, invisible capital in the kind of films I make. And so uh, in the end, it got together. So a, a lot of them, the crew is third world people. Uh, I, I take, I also mix my students from Howard University every time I do movies in Africa or in the in Jamaica, in this case, where we shot the film, etc., and uh, that's it. I don't know if it answers your question, but it's there somewhere. Um, it answers some questions that I was going to uh, ask you, and I think uh, just the way you laid everything down is really important because I think it also speaks to uh, your prior films, uh, such as Bush Mama, Harvest, Three Thousand Years, Ashes and Embers, uh, and you know just the way you had to go about making this film, and you know just like you. Uh, just share, uh, you you know, you had to utilize that same approach. But in terms of the actors, um, how did you go about uh, casting them? Well, I started, you know, for years practicing with community actors that are community people who, who didn't require glamour of money from me, but just saying, yeah, let's make a you know, film about our history. Those kinds of, it's to, again, it goes back to LA. Uh, those black people in South Central LA helped me bush, do Bush Mama. And uh, those, uh, you know, Barbara O, the sister who played yeah. in Bush Mama, as you said, you know, all these are people, these, you know, you can't say you paid, these are people who believed in wanting to do our own story. So I was able to tap like that with little pay this time, at least, et cetera. And um, so the actors, you know, it's the years of looking for people. Um, and it's usually community of black people who knew, I know I used to have my script read at Howard as I was shaping it further. Uh, and, and there were people suggesting that you can say to some extent, community people helped me cast. You know what, for Shango, I think I saw a brother who was reading some poetry in downtown yeah. Washington DC, et cetera. Then I went and looked after this guy and it was very correctly appropriate. So. And then again, the Nunu character 
I went all over. I went to Canada looking for an African sister to play. I didn't want African American sister to play with accent, mm -hmm. distant, you know, you know, doing. I don't like that kind of things. So I, I wanted mm -hmm. to mix accents from different parts of Africa, the Caribbean, and the sister Nunu, uh, Alexandra is her name. She's a Ghanaian actress, and it was a big difficult difficult in the beginning because she comes out of a very British colonial setup where she. They do overacting and a very Nigerian kind of style overacting. So we have to tone her down to what mm -hmm. I wanted. And she rose to occasion better than what I had imagined the character. Yeah. And then um, how did you uh, go about casting uh, Mona? What was that? Mona, you know, I really found when we were looking for a location in South Carolina, I found a friend of mine called Dwight and Dwight introduced me to her. He is a well-known uh, production manager in, in, in the industry. Uh, and, you know, he introduced me I, when I was meeting him. I found him. You're shooting a film in South Carolina. We met and he respects me. And we sat and we met in the hotel and he introduced me and I liked her because she was uh, she had been in you know gone to Nigeria. She understood the landscape where I was working from. She she you know uh, she I knew she could bring a lot of her own search and her own Africanity into the part. And so uh, basically, it's a community cast. I would say <laughs> black folks help you cast. <laughs> and yeah. I thought I I learned in L.A. Uh, I'm not. I'm not crazy about professional actors. Too much. Too much stigma. Too much ego. I couldn't afford to bail them out from their starhood. To, although some wanted to be in my film, I. It is. Uh, you know, for me, this is where when one be, believes they're stars, they're too expensive emotionally for a production of my kind. I can't. I can't bring them down from the stars of the galaxies to be normal with the rest of the community. I like normal community work together to do movies. I don't like stars. I don't like tripping black people. That itself mm -hmm. is another expense in, in budget. I cannot afford their mindset. And therefore, I'm always for non-actors, community people, but people who are very aware of the, the importance of telling your own story. This is a germinating, important idea People, not only actors, the crew should have that. If not, you, can, you know, it's not by money, by pay. You know, this is not, I can't. I can't be the, the, the man who pays good, no. In fact, I tell them in advance, I may not pay you. You better get yeah. it right, but I'll talk to you like paying you. I will direct you like I'm paying you. I'll demand of you like I'm paying you. And let's start, before we get together, before we work, no, this is what's going to happen. And, and folks just, you know, allowed me to, you know, to, to, um, to really do it my way in the sense yeah. that without denying their contribution, but I don't want them, I don't want stereotype idea of cinema, how it's done. I don't want black people come and lecture me shit that I'm ex ex exhausted. Sorry, my brother, I curse. But no the worries. No, things that I'm exhausted about. I don't like tripping black people to come and tell me, oh, there was a black man who told me I couldn't afford to do this movie. I'm going to kill myself. I said, the hell with you. He was he was already imprisoned by the idea of how to do a movie. That's white supremacy's power over black mm -hmm. instincts, creative instincts. Yeah, not only in terms of storytelling, but also in terms of how the production of it all comes together. Yeah, my brother, that's it. And in production, if you keep thinking about the way white people make movies, you're finished. You can't make, you can never make a movie like that. Yeah. And um, and you say you don't like working with stars. I know that's consistent throughout your body of work. And, you know, in St. Kofa in particular, you know, there are some recognizable people who um, were part of uh, the film. You mentioned Muda Baruka, uh, you know, whose poetry or many people know. And then also, um, at the, speaking of po poetry, you had the spoken word piece that, that opens the film by Oscar Brown Jr. Mm. Uh, yeah, well, Oscar yeah. Brown Jr. is like, to me, he's the most uh, relevant black artist in America because he was, he's one who refused to be enslaved. 
But yeah. the best in jazz, the best in music, the best in interpretation. He wrote scripts himself. I was blessed to have him. When I when I met him, I met him, I think I met him with Nina Simone in Washington, DC here. He introduced me actually to her. And and then so I just knew his voice. I needed when I wrote that part, I said. He's the only guy, but I, how do I get him from Chicago? He happened to be in DC one day, and I said to him, "Can you really do something for me?" He read it in 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 in, in two takes. In two takes, I mm. I went to where he was staying. I I took a recorder, recorded him in two takes. It's a brother I can, I don't have to direct. You know, he he said it was something he he was waiting to read. If he was happy, I wrote it, and it was for him really. When you think of it, without me knowing. I, Initially, when I dropped it, I didn't know who would read it. But at a certain point, I said, Oscar, Oscar Brown. That's the only guy who could read it. And also, he doesn't bring baggages of stardom. Right. He's, he's well known. And I say star really is really a, a mental illness that we inherit of the star system of Hollywood. But there are black people who are free of that. That is not yeah. what I'm including. Yeah, and you know, just uh, you know, a little bit about Oscar Brown Jr. When um, I hear that uh, that piece that opens the film, it uh, you know, from as you know, as much as I know about Buck White, uh, the play that he wrote uh, featuring Muhammad Ali, uh, you know, it kind of uh, you know, you know what the you know the the lines in that piece that opens the film, you know, just made me think of that. Uh, as well, you know, I didn't know he wrote that. Did, you wrote, did he write that play or Muhammad played? Muhammad Ali played? Uh, Buck White? Are you sure? I, be I believe so. Yeah? Um, I didn't know personally. I'm glad to you know hear that because I didn't I didn't know he he wrote that. I've seen him and I've seen it in a in a movie, uh, in a documentary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he. Um, yeah, he did um, adapt them. Uh, he did adapt that um, for uh, theatrical production. Okay, that's fantastic. I didn't know, brother. That's nice. Yeah, that's good to know. No worries. But that's the beauty of these conversations, right? We learn from each other. Thank you for letting me, letting me know because <laughs> I used to show it, I used to show that a documentary where there's scenes from that play from Broadway, and I used to show it to my students at Howard. Yeah. 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 It was and, a very, very, very powerful documentary on, on Muhammad Ali. So I used to show that. And I didn't know. I wish I knew. I wish I knew. OK, go ahead, my brother. Sorry. No worries at all. And uh, we could talk about uh, your uh, production company, My Do Films. It's, uh, you know, it's, you know, you established it. You know when you uh, started teaching at Howard, um, it's run by you and your wife, and uh, it's a. And if I'm not mistaken, it's run out of uh, St. Hopeful Bookstore uh, that yeah. you own in DC. Yeah. I'm, I'm in there. In fact, I'm in the basement where we edit the film, where we edited many films here. Um, it's you know my wife Shirikiana and I uh, started that distribution company to distribute black films. You know when I came out of UCLA to Howard. There were black films from America, Africa, and nobody was seeing these films. And I, although I had distribution for my films, I felt still it was like out of ex very in a very exploitative relationship. So my wife and me felt we have to have our own distribution company, and that's how we we created MyFa to distribute African Americans and African films. We in, you know we distributed throughout America in schools, and you know cultural centers. Uh, Kathy Collins's film, Larry Clark's, uh, right. Charlie Burnett's you know you know uh, film, Usman Samben. Uh, Med Hondo. We were distributing a lot of African and African American films, and uh, it's basically housed here. Although not at a certain point, we could not distribute, we could not do justice without cash flow, without cash power, and so we just retreated to our own films and and proceeded to do our own films. And then we we incorporated Nagorwad Productions, and we made many films. My wife has done two films, three films. Right. I think brick by brick, uh, and then uh, through the door of no return, 
And then right. the Pan African film she just finished uh, two, three, four years ago, I think five years ago. And so, um, uh, you know, Adwa, I did Teza with it. So we, we have our own distribution company and we have our own production company. Uh, we established it initially really to embrace more filmmakers with it. But, you know, reality hits you. And so you retreat to your own films only at a certain point. Yeah, that certainly makes sense. And you, you mentioned uh, those filmmakers earlier uh, who uh, you collaborated with. Uh, you know, you're definitely speaking my language uh, mm -hmm. with all of those names. And just to uh, talk about when Sankofa was initially released in 1993, how did you go about distributing? Well, you know, initially we were completely... Um, we went to Berlin. The first screening is in the Berlin Film Festival. It was really by Europeans embraced, um, but the American press, the American, even the you know the film movement, they just completely uh, uh, made us non-existent. And few festivals we did in Canada, etc. And then at a certain point, we just asked the African American community that we are very aware of here in Washington, D.C., um, made out of the Black community. We showed them the film and say, you distribute it. And uh, the whole idea of Tsankova family, my wife is more, uh, she began as more, she was more the activist. I had to give, by that time I said, I'm going to pay everything I owe working. I'm not going to do the distribution because to me, I'm tired, have done the film. And I said to those Black folks, if you don't, think it's a film you want to distribute, you know, you want to be part of, forget it. If you want to be part of it, take it over because from here on, I'm, I'm, I'm gone, I'm out. And so the, they got together, created this whole idea of Sankova family. And from there, it's my brother's history. Black folks put us on the map of the world. You know, they organized themselves in community everywhere for at least in 30 something states in America a Sankova family was established to bring the film. Without them, we never could bring it anywhere yeah. because we were renting theaters. We were forewalling like Oscar Michaud, the idea right. of his, right. you know. So it, it, it was not easy for us to do. But the racism, the, the eviction, how many times we got evicted, it's unbelievable. You cannot imagine my brother. Uh, people, you know, in America, you know, it's all superficial, sentimental. The bullshit is what is always um, highlighted. They were evicting mm -hmm. us out of theater. Didn't do nothing but good mm -hmm. business for them. More than us, they made the business. Not only they took 50% of our, our profit, they also were making money with Coca-Cola, with the, the popcorns, hot dogs. We were making them money. We were paying... Mm -hmm. uh, 50% of our, our gross, et cetera. So in the end, they're the winners because unless you have black theater owners, you can't still win. You think of uh, not just, um, you know, how people mobilize to uh, show really important black independent films, but you think of uh, music performances, you think of theatrical uh, stage performances, and mm -hmm. not only are you made, uh, not only is there a lot of money to be made uh, just from the ticket sales itself, but you think of how people congregate with each other. You think of how oh, people yeah. arrange, uh, you know, what, what outfit they're going to wear uh, yeah. when they go yeah. to make their appointment, they go to the beauty shop or to the mm -hmm. barber shop, or, you know, all, you know, all of those uh, embedded economic uh, mm -hmm. you know, to come out and uh, to support the work uh, that Black independent artists are doing. And I mentioned that, uh, you know, you, uh, your, your bookstore, uh, St. in D.C., I had a privilege to uh, visit uh, St. Kofa at one point uh, when I was in D.C. And um, I, I doubt you remember, but I actually did meet you briefly. Uh, so I have yeah. seen you in the flesh. Yeah, but okay. I mentioned... <laughs> and I mentioned that because um, the way I uh, came across St. Kofa was um, in the mid late nineties, you know, I would go through, uh, you know, some uh, black bookstores in Milwaukee and in Chicago. And back when they had VHS tapes, mm -hmm. I know, uh, you know, I would recall seeing that title. And I think um, I may have seen Bush mama mm -hmm. as well. And what's really, uh, you know, 
at least I think is exciting is, uh, you know, just how, you know, you take uh, how the film was available in the 90s and fast forward to where we are now, Array is um, showing uh, Sankofa in 28 cities in 28 days, which uh, Milwaukee has the honor to be part of that. Uh, how did that um, relationship uh, between you and Avery DuVernay, how was that established? Well, you know, black folks, you know, black folks, mm -hmm. Ava, no, you know, Ava is a gift to me through black folks, black folks who believed in me, who knew I, I was trying my best to do right. And they, uh, I told her, I earned you because of black folks, black folks, you know, and she's a very important um, uh, part of, you know, our filmmaking world now. At a time where we are now, she is really a very, the, you know, our backbone, I could say, it, for me and my wife, she's up right there. But it's black people, black people in America, you know, I became a filmmaker. Uh, black people uh, made me. They say, "Oh, you're a good filmmaker," and otherwise, wh white America don't make you believe in nothing. So black people said, "Oh, when I when they saw my you know child of resistance, they said you are our filmmaker," and they embraced me. And so I'm an invention of really my own my whole idea. You know, my whole you know struggle in cinema is black people. That's my backbone even to films I've done in my country, in, in Ethiopia, uh, films I've, you know, they are the genesis of who I am. And so she's a, a gift of that whole panoramic uh, African-American uh, people I earned as my relatives, as my brothers, as my sisters. And so, uh, you know, that's part of, you know, to me, as far as I'm concerned, she is, um, you know, for a long time, I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, you know, the people, you know, like in Philadelphia, black folks said, you know, there's this sister you got to meet, brother. She's really, you know, trying to do what Sankofa, you know, did. Oh, God, who? You know, and I'm, uh, so when, especially when somebody's in Hollywood, I, I don't, I don't, I, you know, to me, I, I, I have no time for Hollywood people. And so right. for a long time, I didn't know. I didn't know Ava, uh, I didn't know, uh, not, you know, to me, I have known from Sydney Poitier to, you know, so I can name you stars and stuff, but I felt I wasted time with, you know, black folks in Hollywood, in my view. And mm -hmm. she is one person that, you know, uh, for me, I start, you know, I, I remember she, uh, she had met me apparently many times, but I could, I can't remember her because that's for me the way I am. I'm straight going to my my you know my life. But right. she was at Howard, and then she came to my office. People brought her, introduced her, but didn't even pay attention to her. But then I was going, I was losing. I lost a student. I was looking for the student. I went to the auditorium, and she was on the stage speaking. I didn't put it all together because I'm absent-minded. Mm. I just were looking for my student. In the miss, in the middle of my walking there, they asked her who did she, who is your influence or something to that effect, and she said that Professor Haile Garima that he's right there. But every time I introduced him, he keeps forgetting me. So I said to her, "No, my sister, I'm an old man. I I forget everything." And after that, I really her voice just cracked open something in me. That crackling voice of hers just went in. And I said, who is this sister? And mm. Brad, of course, Bradford Young, who, you know, you know, who was a cinematographer, who was at Howard. And I, I, I said that, and he says to me, that's who I've been trying to tell you, talking to him. <laughs> so I'm, you know, I'm I'm I earned her like this. This is because she cared. She didn't take it personal about none of, you know, how I dealt with when we met in a few times. But everywhere I went, they would mention this woman to me. I wouldn't even, later on, I gathered, it's her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, you mentioned Bradford Young. Um, he uh, was a cinematographer on uh, several of her projects, uh, a Howard alumnus, as well as uh, Hans Charles, who uh, also came out of Howard, who uh, was the cinematographer for uh, 13th. Mm -hmm. and. 
you know, speaking of Howard, um, I came uh, across an article that mentioned that you were teaching a course um, outside of the university context called Liberated Territory. And I'd love for you to talk about that. Yeah, uh, you know, um, this whole thing, you know, uh, for me, uh, in fact, I did the first one I did uh, in, a, in, a, in its fullest context was at Array. Um, uh, mm. you know, with Ava's, uh, at Ava's, uh, or, you know, organization or institute. And basically, you know, the whole problem about cinema is the cliche, the stereotype, and the aesthetic colonization of how to utter your cinematic expression. And so how does one, how does one empowers their own narrative logic how do you empower your own accent cultural accent your identity how do you make it you know this is very clear in music it's not contestable in jazz yeah could you tell them to be quiet it's not contestable in jazz in music um in literature african-american literature you know but in in film it is caught up in the cobweb of uh Hollywood mainstream imperialism of how to make cinema mm -hmm. and they in including the very grammar of cinema the very utterance of once upon a time etc so over the years my life at Howard was to establish this liberated approach of conceiving a story uh putting it into a screenplay without losing its narrative identity and then translating it into the medium of cinema and it's been my 40 years journey but i, I never succeeded to do it the way i wanted to do it howard because academia mm -hmm. does not allow um uh what i was trying to do and so yeah. uh I knew when I left Howard, that was the time for me now to empower that. And I, I in fact, you know, we're planning uh, the, you know, the subsequent, you know, the sequential order of this, this workshop. We'll announce it soon um, to do it here in our own building. And I've been doing it, you know, in Europe, Africa, we did it a lot, different places. Now I'm gonna station it here and then see how we can, and they incorporate a lot of people I know that complement this liberated aspect of film production. Uh, but, but basically to your question, it is a mindset that has to change and how you conceive a story, the whole pregnancy process and how mm -hmm. you defend that without being defensive, but defending it without being defensive. That itself right. is a dialectics that needs uh, you can't be blind, uh, blindly, uh, I'm right. You have to, you know, you have to know you have been contaminated. Uh, you have not been free from, especially in my case, Hollywood colonized me right there, you know, from my mother's bosom in Africa. Mm -hmm. It took me there, snatched me and made me its own colony. That's why I end up in America. That's why I end up speaking English. And so... <laughs> I, I use my own journey in writing in my own language, in my own, it's not only that I write in Amharic, it's not enough to write in Amharic. It's not enough mm -hmm. to write in Wolof. It's not a night, but to write in your own accent means your cultural identity as well as your personal individual identity and how that identity expresses itself in the creative process of cinematic production. And so this could only lead on in a non-formal setting. Yes. And, you know, just hearing you describe all that, uh, you, know, you know, something uh, that you said that I found quite powerful, you know, learning to defend without being defensive. And, you know, just that notion and then, you know, just calling uh, this course liberated territory, uh, you know, something that I find powerful is how it centralizes agency to 
be fully present in your agency to tell the stories that you want to tell from a liberated standpoint and not be confined to uh, particular kinds of structures that yeah. stifle you. Yeah, yeah, my brother. It's a, you know, I, I remember a sister from the Mississippi Delta, you know, and she read her school, because for me, I don't teach formula first. I don't subject students to the three act our story and bullshit from Hollywood. I don't, I overcame it when I was a student at UCLA. I rejected those people who wrote those books. I, I was, there was something incongruent about my accent and verse what they, the formula they want to impose. And so she wrote a script before any formula. And I told her, you are BB King in skirt. And mm. what I meant by that was that she, she had identity. She comes from the Delta. And her script now is very, you have to meander it, nurse it carefully. You can't mm -hmm. impose formula on her and expect it to be a story of hers. You see, this is the, this is how, uh, this is what makes it hard to overcome Eurocentric imperialism in our mindset. In a, not only in our mindset, but are also in our nerve endings and instincts, in our pencil, uh, in our writings, it comes to pervert it. And so that's where the defense comes, to give birth and nurse it through without losing its identity itself is full of booby traps. The, the road is full of booby traps. And so, uh, you know, for me, African-Americans, you know, bring the way they did with jazz bring an amazing wealth i've seen it when the students first come to howard i've seen it in their utterance until they're contaminated but with how to do right. the formula stereotype how to do because one teacher teaches that another teaches that there's not uniformed anything and so that eclectic thing was and uh, to me that I uh, was actually very uncomfortable in my 43 years at Howard University. Throughout my struggle there, I was very uncomfortable at people who impose formula because that's the easy thing to memorize and teach people. You buy yeah. the book, you memorize, you teach. That's easy. I didn't come from that. I came with a group of people who rejected that mm -hmm. at UCLA, but searching for alternative as I was writing my own story. I mean, a lot of times in Bush Mama, uh, it got very better. My accent got better in Ashes and Embers. It got better, better at Sankofa, but you can't put it in the formula form. You can't. Right. Why? Because it, it represents my disjointed accent, which is my accent, my narrative logic, my unmolded, unfiled narrative logic. And so this is like a battle of uh, discomfort when you are in an institution. And I think in the case of your work, Mr. Garima, in terms of um, why you must resist that formula, because you told narratives that are about dismantling institutions that talk about the stifling of uh, white supremacist institutions upon black communities. Uh, you know, yeah, my, was brother, but they, with, uh, my, my brother, but many people before me genuinely try to do that. But dismantling yeah. and formula don't go together. When uh -huh. you want to dismantle by content, the form starts to make you be the slave of who you opposed. So to be on time, yeah. perilous culture is not enough. But yes to reject the formula itself, the form, the jacket, the closing, that itself mm -hmm. is very critical. To me, this is where I'm tangling imperfectly. I'm not sure really there. I'm imperfectly aware of I'm tangling with this battle. But a lot of people yeah. throughout history who opposed imperialism did not succeed because their, their form submitted in the end saying, you are the absolute uh, em emperor. You are the absolute empire. I submit by singing like you. 
In fact, Sterling Brown calls it the uh, the the hummingbird theory. You know that you you know a bird that doesn't have its own song. Mm. Hummingbird is that the hummingbird or the dodo? Which one is that? Yeah, hummingbird. <laughs> no, he's the, the Sterling Brown has said it somewhere. I'll find and let you know one day. But he was talking about a bird that doesn't have its own song. And now this brother is in literature. He has been tangling with it earlier. And I learned from him a lot because, yeah. you know, his form is anti, anti white supremacy. He did not submit to white supremacy. Sterling Brown was very revolutionary. He was yeah. aware of it. And, um, Mm. In fact, I made a film on here with my students called uh, uh, After, After Winter. Winter. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you if you haven't seen it, see it because he talks a little bit about that. That I, I wish I knew more about him when I was doing that film. But anyway, go ahead, my brother. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. I, I had that pause for a moment because I was trying to think of the the title of the project uh, mm -hmm. that you had made about Sterling Brown. After Winter, Sterling Brown. Yeah, yeah. After winter, so he wrote a poem called "After Winter." Very touchy. It touched me so much. I made it the title of it, and you know, with his name. Yes, and throughout our conversation, you've been talking about this manling formula. Uh, you know, just breaking out of uh, this uh, colonial mindset about telling stories about the history of uh, Africans throughout the diaspora. Uh, and I'm curious to know, you know, just. Uh, from uh, growing up in Ethiopia, uh, you know, with the films that you uh, have made, uh, St. Kofi in particular, uh, would you say that your approach to uh, making these films, telling these stories are informed to the storytelling traditions that you were immersed in growing up in Ethiopia? Well, let me tell you, my brother, it is the, it's the, my father is a playwright. Yes. He has, you know, he has his own aesthetics. He don't know no Shakespeare. He don't know no no, no, <laughs> no Moliere, no, you know, I was, I was Eurocentrically colonized and ha I ejected out of my father's bosom into white supremacy in mm -hmm. the way it, it functions in Ethiopian elite, the Ethiopian elite. And so I came to America colonized my brother. I wish I came as a student of my father. No, my father was another planet. He was anti-colonialist in his writing. Hmm. He wrote plays, traditional plays. He has his own form, aesthetics, etc. So, you know, it is Black America that turned me back towards my father. Black America's rejection of white supremacy, Black America's poetry and literature and culture made me be connected to my father or my Ethiopian identity. And so, you know, this is unfortunate, but it happens like this, my brother. In fact, why would African-Americans be? Because they know what it means to lose. Mm -hmm. They're the best examples of what it means to lose. Thomas Sankara said it better. African-Americans know what it means to lose the preciousness of Africa. He says, unlike Africans even who take it for granted. And so... Uh, I, you know, to me, I think more and more I'm getting in touch with my cultural origin without, you know, within my own individual idiosyncrasy and identity also. Okay, because yeah. that's also a factor. Yeah. That's also a factor. And so when I'm I'm writing now and I'm Herrick, my scripts, etc., I am I am connected back to the my grandmother. Who told stories mm. around the fire when I was a kid before I saw movies mm. that that actually snatched me from her and my father's place. And so I am, but you know, it's a rehabilitation. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I, I live a life of rehabilitations because uh, mm. I don't go into regrets and guilt because to me, for whatever historical reason, I ended up this way so much mm. the better i gained more i'm not easily bamboozled like many ethiopians who are easily uh colonized by white supremacy 
And had I not left my country, that could have been my own fate. Mm. And so my journey, you know, brought me into this kind of uh, search for meaningful expressions in in anything that I wanted to express myself in. Mm. And so... I want to uh, ask you of uh, any up upcoming projects uh, or any projects that you're working on right now. You mentioned uh, your wife's uh, film that came out uh, a few years ago. Um, I know your son uh, released his film uh, Residue uh, a couple years ago. Uh, so you know you, it's great to uh, you know see uh, you know your family immersed in storytelling. And in your case, uh, what's for uh, Holly Karima. Well, I am. Or what's now? I've been finished now for almost a year. A film called Black Lions, Roman Wolves, mm -hmm. about the 1935 battle war uh, uh, between Ethiopia and Italy. Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia is finished. I'm fighting with the Italians for the footage, the newsreel footage. They took Killing My People. So I'm now, mm. the film is stuck to get the rights for this newsreel footage. Um, I am at the same time, that, that film took over 20 years. Over 20 years again, I've been doing a film. When I did Sankofa, the maroon part of it was never to my satisfaction. In fact, my wife, yes. well, you know, we were called producers. She really wants to do a sequel of Sankofa. But... Mm. I didn't want to do the sequel of Sankofa until I really study marunage in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so I promised myself after Sankofa, the brief um, discoveries I was making in Louisiana and the caves, etc., maroons in America, I said, I want to study it before I do a drama on it. So I, I delved to do a documentary and have still been in it because apparently it's a big story. Initially, yes. I wanted to do a documentary and then go to the sequel, Sankofa. So it took me up, up to now. You can see it now. I'm editing. This is actually here. The, the, the Seminole burial in Texas. This is the Seminole, Black Seminole burial cemetery that Africans in America meet every year in February to tap into their people uh, from a cemetery from uh, that traces itself back into this runaway Africans in Florida. It traced them back into South Carolina, North Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. And then I'm also in Mexico filming I, I finished filming, but in Mexico, Africans who run away, the descendants of Africans who run away from Mississippi, da, 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 through Oklahoma, and when Creek Indians and white people, you know, still would not let, you know, would not, would want to really still enslave, uh, in, play the enslaving game, they escaped into Mexico. Mexican government, they, you know, they had grant of land nacimiento Mexico. There I filmed the descendants, my brother, everywhere. In fact, once I got to Nascimento, I've been there twice filming. I stopped going beyond that because it's mm. another planet. Because Africans, um, you know, their history in Marunaj is so vast. I said to the film crew, I said, I'm not going. In fact, black people came to Nascimento from other part of Mexico, from Guerrero, uh, from all these places and say, come and film us. We are the descendants from Louisiana. We are the, I say, excuse me, I want to finish this film before I die. Another young filmmaker should pick it up from here because it's another, Mexico is another history. So for mm -hmm. me, yeah, I was glad I didn't really do what I had as a script because I was not prepared. And this documentary has immersed me. So now I'm editing as you see me, I'm now organizing and editing the uh, this part of the, in fact, I'm showing clips and lecturing in places, you know, to make sure people are aware of what I'm doing, et cetera. I'll be, I'll be in Rhode Island soon, et cetera. So uh, for me, 
I'm happy with this. I come to my editing room. This is my liberated territory. I make films I want to make. Is it, you know, is it easy to do? No, no, but I never expected it to be easy. Mm. Yeah. And so it's just like what you said with your current project about black America redirecting you back to your father and grandmother. And so it's wonderful to see it manifest this way. Thank you, my brother. Indeed. Uh, the pleasure is all mine, uh, Mr. Garima. You know, I've, um, you know, I did my dissertation on uh, Charles Burnett and looking at his film set in LA and what that meant was being immersed in your work. And uh, it's truly um, an honor to uh, talk with you. It's an honor to screen your film um, through Black Lens in uh, collaboration with Ray. And Milwaukee uh, residents, uh, yeah, they, uh, they're really blessed with your work because at the beginning of February, uh, UW Milwaukee, their union cinema screened Bush Mama. And so hopefully wow. those people who uh, had a chance to see uh, that film get to see, uh, have seen Sankofa uh, within the Oriental Theater in Milwaukee. So yeah. Mr. Garima, uh, it has been an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you, my brother. Thank you for having me and stay strong and safe. Thank you. Uh, you were pretty much um, what uh, I think this is the reason why Black Links was created, to um, not only create a, a path for emerging Black filmmakers, but also to honor uh, Black filmmakers uh, who set the stage for a program like Black Links to exist. And so, yeah, thanks for uh, helping us realize this. Thank you again. Indeed, and thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Likewise, and thank you very much to Array for helping make this happen and oh, America's yeah. Black Holocaust Museum uh, to Dr. Burt Davis and his team. Thank you all for a wonderful partnership and for making this conversation a reality. Thank you, my brother.